Good morning. I want to welcome each of you and those joining us online. We welcome all of you. And I'm curious, I, I want to start with a question today. H- have you personally ever believed a lie? And then at some point in time came to know, like, what the truth is? So l- let me give you a big one for me. So when I grew up in Michigan, in elementary school, I was taught a simple little phrase to remember my history with, and the phrase was this, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and discovered the world was round. You know what? That's not true. (laughs) Now, for some of you, you're thinking, like... Who would have ever believed that? Like, I was never taught that in school. And some of you are thinking right now, what? You mean that's not true? Actually, I was 50 years old when I found out that that's not true. And you say, well, what part of it's not true? The part that's not true is the part that the world believed that the earth was flat in 1492. It did not only know that the world was round in 1492, but it did in 1392 and 1292 and 1192, all the way back to the third century before Jesus. You say, well, how in the world could the school get that so wrong? Because it wasn't just my school. It was every school and university in the United States that was teaching that. In fact, I learned that when the British Historical Society 30 years earlier had said that the flat earth myth was one of the 10 greatest hoax in the history of the world. 10 greatest hoax. Well, where that came from is in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there were a group of educators that decided that they needed to figure out a way to pull the universities away from Christianity. Because almost all the private schools and a number of the public schools in the United States were actually founded as Christian colleges by Christian educators because throughout the history of the Christian church, education actually came from the Christian church. Universities, libraries, even public education Throughout history had come through the process of the church bringing it forward. And so, like, how do we get these universities like Yale and Harvard and Princeton and so forth to give up on Christianity? So there were a couple of these folks that actually fabricated a whole history of the world, rewrote history to say that the church had always been against science. And they cited the flat earth myth that the church said the world was flat as the reason to believe that the church was always antagonistic to science. Now, like, the evidence for what happened historically is overwhelming. Like, it's something that you think, how in the world did they get away with that? Well, they got away with it because it began to be taught in the colleges, and so teachers learned it at school, and they began to teach it in the classrooms, and A generation grew up believing it, and another generation grew up believing it, and another generation grew up believing it, until everybody actually believed it. And then finally, some historians stood up to it and said, we can't let this stuff go on. So here's what's real. What's real is, is that anybody that is aware, that doesn't still think what they were taught, but actually knows what's true, no longer believes that the church thought that the earth was flat, and it certainly wasn't that way in Christopher Columbus's day. But here's what everybody still believes. Test yourself if you believe this. That the church has always been anti-science. You see, what happened is, the truth was eventually clarified, but the goal stuck. The goal stuck. That's the problem of a lie. And when it comes to lies, I actually did a whole sermon series on this back in 2015 called The Clash. You can go look it up. I tackled in a sermon series and a lecture series all of these topics that are just untrue. Things about slavery, things about um, the 
women, things about the environment, things about education, things about science, and kind of walked through the history and laid out what the church actually did. So I would encourage you to go back and look at that and use it as a basis to begin to think outside of what the mainstream may have kind of told you. But here's the point. The point is, all throughout the history of the church, people have been telling lies about Christianity in the church, and it was no different in the first century. In fact, when Peter was writing, the, the myth that was being told or lied about was that Christians were cannibals. Because the bread represented the body, and the cup represented the blood. They said that Christians actually were eating flesh and blood from humans in the communion service. And that circulated widely as a lie within the church. So when Peter writes about the hostility of the world in 2 Peter, it, it's, it's not something new, it's something that's always existed. And so we've been looking at this series, Being Christian in a Hostile World, from the book of 2 Peter. And if you'll turn to chapter 3, Peter writes these words. We looked at them last week. He says, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them, that's 1 Peter and 2 Peter, as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. Now, last week, Rick explained this phrase. This is correct thinking, genuine thinking, right thinking, clear thinking, actual, reasonable thinking. He says, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. In other words, he says that there's two ways to think wholesome. The first way is through revelation that God spoke, first of all, through the prophets, explaining the world, explaining reality. And then he sent his son Jesus into the world, who also came to explain God and explain reality to everyone. And you say, what do you mean by reality? Reality is how the world works, how people are formed, how people are made in the image of God, what God desires to create a human society that actually works together, where people thrive in that. And the Bible lays all of that out. Jesus came and explained it again, and then Jesus proved that he was from God by overwhelming historical evidence and over 500 eyewitnesses that saw him rise from the dead. And what Peter's saying is, is that you think correctly when you take revelation, what God says, and then you look at reality, how the world works, how people operate, what righteousness, goodness looks like, and you use reason and that's always been the Christian way. Listen to what God says, then look at what he says in relationship to how the world works, and you're going to land in truth. But one of the reasons why that's so hard to do, he says in verse 3, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, now that's the time between when Jesus rose from the dead and when Jesus returns, that's called the last days in Scripture, we're living in that time, Scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. This is the issue, the false prophets, the scoffers following their evil desires. Now next week, we're going to look at verses 4 and following, and we're going to find out that one of the big things that they scoffed at was, where's the return of Jesus? Where's God coming back to intervene in the world? We're going to look at that next week. Like, why is God taking so long? Anybody here ever think, like, why is God taking so long? And so, just like one little hint about next week. Because he was waiting for you. You know? Okay. We'll come back and talk about that this week. But I want you to think about the false teachers for a minute. They're scoffers. They take what God says is true. They make fun of it. They mock it. They belittle it. They criticize it, and they're doing that because they don't want that to be true. It says they're following their own desires. In other words, I don't want a God to rule over me. I want my own way. I want my own will. I want to make my own reality. I don't want any rules for morality. I want the freedom to do whatever I feel, whatever I desire. So that's the motivation behind that. And oftentimes we leave revelation and reason behind and pursue something that makes everybody feel affirmed and feel good, okay? So with that in mind, 
the church has always faced people that come forward with criticism and in some cases just outright, outright fabricated lies. And I just want you guys to know that the, the, the people who taught me in elementary school this lie, they were sincere, loving people. Like in their mind, they were teaching the truth. They thought it was true. And the college professors that taught them that, they thought it was true too. And it went back generations of people that actually thought that was true. Which makes you, if you're in an education system right now, you might want to pause and just say, is there anything like that I'm being taught that may actually not even be historically, factually true? Kind of raises a little bit of a question for us, right? So here's what's really interesting. The persecution's always existed in different forms. The church has always been criticized. Jesus has been criticized in different forms. But in the last century, in the 20th century, there was a phenomenon that took place that was really profound. There were a group of nations that decided, based on the utopian idea that they could create a perfect society, a perfect world, dove into a massive experiment using control of thoughts, if we can make everybody think the same thing, and if we can't, then we'll shame them, intimidate them, reprogram them, and imprison them to get everybody on the same page, because if we can get everybody on the same page around the right ideals that we could actually create a perfect world where everybody and everything work together. One of those nations, the Soviet Union, the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, started in 1917, and over the course of its life, literally exterminated tens of millions of their own citizens in order to support this ideology that they had created to make a perfect world. That is profound to think that happened, and they're not the only ones. One of the key proponents of that ideology was we need to eliminate all traces of God, all traces of religion. We've got to stamp that out. That's what's ruining the world, and we've got to stamp that out. So they went after that. Now, when it finally collapsed on itself and just fell apart, uh, many people thought that this would never happen again. Like, no, n never could this ever happen again. Like, how could this happen and anybody ever go back and try to do that again? But one of the big spokesmen, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was a Russian dissident that was put in prison in the Gulag, and finally, when he was released to the West, he warned the West and he said, listen, if it could happen in Russia, if it could happen in China, and I can name a whole bunch of other countries, if it could happen there that nations would exterminate their own people to promote their ideology. If it could happen, it could also happen in Europe and it could also happen in the United States. I mean, he laid that out there. Now, there are some people today that are starting to look at kind of the trends, the utopian influence or impulse, and say, is it possible that like, we're starting to see a little bit of that? In America today, one of those guys, Rod Dreher, wrote a book, Live Not By Lies. That was the statement that Alexander Solzhenitsyn said. This was the key to overcoming these kind of things. And Rod Dreher began to interview people that lived in the former Soviet Union and ask them, now that you're living in the West, what are you experiencing? And he, he chronicles in this book, Live Not By Lies, people raising the alarm. Like, I can't believe that you guys are doing this in America, what we saw happen um, in the former Soviet Union. And so in his book, um, he makes this statement. And I'm just going to throw it out there for you guys to wrestle with a bit. He says, elites and elite institutions are abandoning old-fashioned liberalism based in defending the rights of the individual and replacing it with a progressive creed that regards justice in terms of groups. It encourages people to identify with groups, ethnic, sexual, and otherwise, and to think of good and evil as a matter of power dynamics among the groups. 
A utopian vision drives these progressives, one that compels them to seek to rewrite history and to reinvent language to reflect their ideals of social justice. He goes on to say, further, these utopian progressives are constantly changing the standards of thought, speech, and behavior. You can never be sure when those in power will come after you as a villain for having said or done something that was perfectly fine the day before. And the consequences for violating these new taboos are extreme, including losing your livelihood and having your reputation ruined forever. Now, I would say that depending on how much time you spend just paying attention to what's going on in culture, you would see some of this right? So we've seen CEOs, we've seen college professors, we've seen professional athletes, uh, we've seen employees of corporations lose their jobs for saying something out loud, expressing an opinion out loud that just 10 years earlier was considered mainstream. We've also seen things like states boycotting states over ideology. Now think about that. Like, Two of the United States? And the purpose of a boycott, keep in mind, is to put economic pressure on a group of people. So if somebody boycotts the state of Texas, they're hoping that business and economy would go bad so your lives would get worse, so you would rise up and overthrow whatever ideology to conform to what another state thinks is the ideology. That's an interesting thing, right? We've seen sports teams boycott cities. I'm not going to play in that city because you guys have the wrong way of thinking in that city. We've seen businesses picketed, protested, sued. We've seen churches in Austin picketed, protested when worshipers were coming to church on Sunday morning for having done nothing in the community but just because of what they believe. I mean, some of these things have happened, but all of us have had friends, family members, neighbors, even schools in disruption and conflict with each other seems really interesting. Now, I know many of you would say, well, that doesn't constitute a trend. That doesn't speak to the future. And if that's what you're feeling, I get it. I mean, there's plenty of things you could look to. There's the internet. There's COVID. I mean, there's all kinds of things that may be stirring up some of this strife. And if your feeling is like it's depressing to think about you like this is getting worse? I don't want to think about it, especially if it's never going to become a thing. Why would you waste your time on that? Life's too short. Like, go have fun. Uh, think on stuff better. There are others of you here that have exactly the opposite feelings. You're thinking to yourself, wow, I feel like the very foundations of our country are shaking. I feel like we're in real trouble. Well, whether you're in the group that thinks, like, these things, you know, they're bothersome, but they're no big deal, or the group that thinks catastrophic, today what I want to do is bring some hope to both groups, and I believe that the Bible speaks in a powerful, hopeful way to this, and I want to take you to Psalm 11, where David himself is writing, and he addresses the challenge of what takes place when there's some kind of a cultural change. So if you'll turn over in your Bibles to Psalm 11. Let me quickly unpack this for you because I think it's really helpful. In verse 1, David lays out his basic view of life. He says in verse 1, in the Lord I take refuge. Like when things are going wrong around me, like the Lord is the person who I run to for protection. But then his antagonist asks him to take a look at what's really happening around him. The verse goes on to say, How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the string to shoot from the shadows at the upright heart. He says, there are bad guys out there and they're looking to get you, David. Like, you're talking about, oh, God's going to take care of me, but there's real threats taking place. And then they say this in verse 3, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, like, that's a legitimate question. If you live in a culture where things that are right and wrong, 
the definitions have all changed. So when, when you thought you were being compassionate to somebody and loving them by treating them in a certain way, and now people are saying to you, no, no, if you do that, you're actually hurting people and you're evil to them. Like, how do you live a righteous life if all the rules change and the things that were good and the things that are biblical are called terrible? Like, how do you do that? Like, David, the foundations are shaking. Like, what are you going to do? And here's David's answer. Look at what he says in the next verse. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. Here's what David says. David says, when the foundations are shaken, look higher. He says, the problem is, if you look down at the foundations of culture, at the foundations of politics, at the foundations of economics, and you're looking at those things, you're looking too low. Like God is on his throne in heaven. God is in his temple in heaven. Look higher. If you feel like the world around you is out of control, keep in mind that God has everything in control, and God can work even in situations that seem the worst it could possibly be. Let me describe one of those situations to you. The year was 1963. The location was in Odessa, Ukraine, part of the former Soviet Union. Odessa sits on the Black Sea. Uh, being a seaport there, the temperature is typically mild all the time. And there was a girl sitting in class, her name, Irina, and Irina's 10 years old. She's sitting in class, and she looks through the dirty windows of her classroom and she sees snowflakes starting to fall. In her mind at that moment, she thought, like snow? It never snows here. This is better than bread. Like, you could stand in the bread lines with everybody else, and eventually you'd, you'd get to the front of the line, and there might be one or two loaves of stale bread for you, but snow? Like, that's priceless. Now, the class that she was sitting in was one of the mandatory classes for all students, and it was atheism. Now, for 60, excuse me, for 46 years since the founding of the Soviet Union, they had been trying to teach the children that there is no God. And they'd done all kinds of things to try to teach the children this, including these mandatory classes. And so the teachers taught it, the supervisors of the school taught it, all of the government officials taught it, all of the people in power taught it, everybody was teaching it. And here's what Irene is thinking. They're trying too hard. Like adults, when, when you tell them you believe in ghosts or gremlins, they say, well, that's just not true. And they say it once, they may say it twice, but they quit saying it. But spending all of this time and all of these words, every drama that the school does is all about how bad Christians are and all of this effort, she thought to herself while she was sitting there, God, you must be real, because why would they spend this much effort on something that's not real? And you must be so powerful that they would be this afraid of you. And while she's sitting there, Looking out the window, she prayed her first prayer. She said, God, the only reason why I have to sit through this atheism class is because of you. <laughs> she said, because if, if you didn't exist, they wouldn't be wasting all this time on you. She said, so if you're real, then make it snow. And for the next three days, it snowed and snowed and snowed and snowed. The deepest, most snow accumulation in 60 years in that city. School was called off. She was out there playing with the kids, building forts and snowmen. Looked like an Austin morning when school's out and there's a little bit of snow, right? Only they got a bunch of snow. And all the time, she's thinking about this God who could make it snow over atheistic, communist airspace. And she thought, you must be real and you must be powerful. And over the next several years, without any help or encouragement from anyone, she began to pray 
began to think, began to wrestle with what she was being taught. And it wasn't until 13 years later that she finally got a hold of a copy of the Bible, which was outlawed in the Soviet Union. And she got a hold of a copy and she read it. And she thought, everything I've ever dreamed about you is all true. And it totally transformed her life. So how is it possible that in a place where there's no access to any relationship with God, and yet God can still speak to a 10-year-old girl in an atheism class. The reason why is because God is on his throne. He's in his holy temple. And if you're a follower of Jesus, if you forget that, you'll get wrapped up in all kinds of fear that will hold you back. Well, God's just not just sitting there. The psalmist goes on to say, in verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple, the Lord is on his heavenly throne, he observes the sons of men, he examines them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, his soul hates. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur, a scorching wind will be their lot, for the Lord is righteous and he loves justice, Upright men will see his face. Now I want you to see the contrast here. It's very clear. He says, for those who reject him and who perpetrate evil in the world, like God's going to judge them. They're not going to win in the end. No matter how much power they may have at any moment, they're not going to win at the end. But what he says about the righteous is really profound. He says in verse 4, or excuse me, verse 5, the Lord examines the righteous. Upright men will see his face. In other words, God is paying attention to those people who are following him. He hasn't deserted you. He's with you. He's constantly beside you. He's walking you through life. And in the process of doing that, you have his presence. You will see his face. You will experience him in profound ways. Which leads us to the second truth that really comes from the psalm, and that's this. When everyone is following the party line, tell and live the truth. Tell and live the truth. We need to actually believe that we are more accountable and more responsible to God than we are to the world around us because at the end of the day, God's presence is always better than the applause that you might get from going along with the people around. Here's the challenge. When we're challenged, we fear. And when we fear, we tend to react in one of three ways. Rick laid this out last week. Our response to fear is fight, flight, or freeze. The temptation is fight. Like one, what, people get, some people get aggressive to a threat. And so I'm going to go out there and I'm going to conquer you because you're forcing me not to believe my, my, the truth that God says or you're not doing the right thing. The other response is to retreat, to, to, like I'm going to a monastery. I'm going to pull my kids, myself back, like we're out of here. And the third response, which I think is for most people, is the freeze. I'm just going to put my head down, no matter what's being said or what's being done, I'm going to put my head down, I'm going to roll with it, I'm going to go along with it, I'm going to protect myself. And what's interesting is, in the former Soviet Union, and that's just one example, but in that place, the majority of the people did not agree with what was happening. And yet, over time they went along with it. That was one of the first things that happened when Irina became a believer when she first prayed and believed in God, was she said, I will no longer just say and do and go along with everything else because my relationship with God and my own humanity is at stake. And so we tell the truth. We live the truth. Now, some of you may be saying, well, like, how do I do that? Well, I want to spend just our last few minutes together walking you through some suggestions that Erwin Lutzer in his book, We Will Not Be Silenced, where he walks through a lot of the cultural issues. Again, both of these books are not the Bible, 
They're not the Bible, so there are going to be things that you disagree with in there. That's great. There's things I disagree with too, <laughs> but they're, they're really helpful. So he goes through five things that Christians can do in the face of a culture that's becoming or is antagonistic. And here's the first one. The first one is prioritize prayer. How do you stay connected with the vision that God's on his throne, God's in his holy temple, and not lose sight of that and get wrapped up in the fear of the world around you? Well, you talk to God, you pray. And I would say that most of us, if we're honest, know that we have room to grow here. In fact, back in August, we did a survey and a bunch of you filled it out where we ask you questions about kind of where you're at. And in that survey, there was a question about prayer. And here's what we discovered from the survey. When asked the question of married people, do you pray with your spouse at least twice a week? 32% said yes, which means 68% of the married couples who say that I have a Christian marriage are not praying together. Like, think about that. There's a lot of room to grow there. What would your life be like if you started bringing God in to all your decisions and your plans and your relationship? And you started including God in everything. Uh, I just, just to let you guys know, Cindy and I pray together every night. I mean, before we go to bed, we, we pray together. It's revolutionized our lives, our marriage, our relationship, our focus. So we get some room to grow there. As it comes to parents, we ask parents, how often do you pray with your kids? And we set the standard at like five times a week. And that even counts meals. Like do you pray. And praying together five times a week... of our parents said, yes, I do that. That's awesome. Over 50% of you, five times a week, if you have kids in your home, you're praying with your kids. That's awesome. Congratulations. 45% of you have the opportunity to start doing that. It would be awesome. It would be awesome. The interesting one was grandparents. So we asked the same question to grandparents. How many of you pray five times a week for your grandchildren? And when we ask that question, 30%. 30% of grandparents pray five times a week for their grandchildren. Now, when my dad retired, I asked him, I said, Dad, what are you going to do with all your free time? He said, Son, I'm busier now that I'm retired than I ever was before. And I know some of you that are retired feel that way because you tell me that. What I would challenge you to do is pray for your grandkids. Go before the Lord on behalf of the generation that many of you are worried about. Take it to him. Prayer. We are having a church-wide prayer meeting, 24 hours of prayer, fasting, coming up on the 14th of November. And if history repeats itself, we'll have a very low percentage who will take the time to give an hour or two during that 24 hours of prayer. Very low percentage. Could it be that part of the reason why we are where we are is because we're not talking to God? And that could change everything for us. So that's the first suggestion. Here's the second suggestion, and that's know the truth. Know the truth. How can you understand and speak the truth and see it if you actually don't know it? And that's a really good question. We also live in a culture that oftentimes brands a statement that's catchy, it sounds cool, it seems like everybody would agree with it, and oftentimes it's only partially obvious what the statement means. But over time, since everybody says it over and over again and you hear it all the time, you kind of accept it and you kind of believe it. And it's possible that many of us are believing lies just because we're living in a culture that repeats things over and over again. In fact, a lot of these slogans actually were brought by various groups before focus groups to try to determine what words to use to make sure the majority of the people wouldn't resist it or push back on it. Now, I I have a list because I started working through and I got a list of so many of these things that like if I just started reading them off, you guys would go, yeah, that's true, yeah, that's true, yeah, that's true, yeah, that's true, isn't it? Do I I have the courage to try it on one of them with y'all? Because as soon as I say it, it's going to trigger everybody. 
And that's the challenge, because if you hear something enough, 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 you start thinking that's right. And then somebody says, well, is it? Are you sure? And then you go, man, that person must be a hater, right? So let me try it, okay? Everybody, white knuckle on your chairs. (laughs) Here's the statement. Diversity is our strength. Think about that for a minute. Diversity is our strength. This gives me an awesome opportunity to use a sports analogy. (laughs) And I've chosen a football team to highlight that Michigan State beat Michigan yesterday. (laughs) And is still undefeated. And I gotta get that in. Because Michigan State's kind of like the Aggie school in Michigan. And the Aggies have found a way, at least in Austin, to claim victory even if the score doesn't show that. And so like, (laughs) Michigan State actually did have more points on the scoreboard than Michigan, so sorry, Michigan fans. But let's think about a football team. Let's take the offense, 11 people on the offense. There's incredible diversity, right? You've got these big, huge guys that play on the offensive line. They can run really fast in one direction. Like, as long as they're going forward, they can run really fast. And they can push people around. And then you've got these smaller guys that are fast as lightning. Like they can run through the line. They can take off. They're so fast, the running backs. And you've got these wide receivers that they can just fly out there on the field. And then you've got this quarterback that thinks he can do it all, right? Except block. (laughs) Or anything that causes any physical harm to him, right? (laughs) So you have a lot of diversity And you need that diversity for a team to function well. But what else do you need? What if the offensive line says, we never get interviewed? We're going to let that quarterback get killed a few times until they start noticing us. Like, what would happen? I mean, you guys understand the analogy. We could walk through this because we all know that what trumps diversity always is teamwork. It's unity. It's trying to get on the same page. And so a better, more accurate statement would be unity in our diversity makes us stronger. Unity in our diversity makes us stronger. So if we're trying to create a society that works best for everybody, we need to come together and work together and understand each other and build bridges, not burn bridges. And if we don't do that, and this just is a power struggle between who gets to be in charge, What ideas get to win the day? We're going to continue to have conflict. So a statement that's thrown out there, if people are like courageous enough to listen and pay attention and evaluate, then we can actually build a better world. And that's why people need to know the truth and think about it rather than simply just buying, like, party-line statements. Now, the reason why statements that are not critically evaluated oftentimes become something that is normative in the culture is because most of what's said in the culture is self-reinforcing. And so if you spend all your time on social media, you're going to hear a similar message. On the media, you're going to get similar messages. If you spend your time like listening to what everybody says in the culture, you're going to get similar messages. And very few people are giving an equal amount of time to really reading the Word of God, having conversations in Christian community, and there's nothing that I can do in 40 minutes a week to overcome all of the input that people are taking in. And so, if you want to know the truth, you got to be willing 
to invest some time in it. Here's the third one. The third one is tell the truth. The third one's tell the truth. Alexander Solzhenitsyn said this. He said, a lie cannot survive if it's not in a person. Lies are statements, but if nobody embraces them or believes them, they don't continue to exist. And so being willing to actually speak up, like you don't have to be mean, aggressive, or challenging everything you hear, but when you know you're in a situation where a lie is stated and you have the truth to not tell the truth, what that does is that allows your silence to be co-opted. And so oftentimes we let vocal minorities do all the talking and the, the majority that's silent, it, we, everybody assumes that everybody agrees with that. And if you're sitting in the silent majority and you're thinking, well, that's not exactly right, but it doesn't seem like anybody else thinks that way, maybe I'm the only one. You actually do a, ser- a service to other people by explaining at least your point of view explaining your point of view. And some of you say, well, if I speak up, like I might lose my job, which leads me to number three. You got to be willing to suffer loss for truth. You got to be willing to suffer loss for truth. At the end of the day, like if maintaining your lifestyle is more important than maintaining your integrity, it's problematic, right? Because what you've done is you've compromised your very personhood to ensure that things are comfortable for you. So, Irene, Irina, she got a Bible at age 23. She started writing poetry about Christianity and about the challenges that were in her country. And that was traveling all over the Soviet Union, and then being picked up all over the world. She was getting tons of attention. And finally, she got the attention of the KGB, the secret police. And at age 28, she was sentenced to seven years of hard labor in the gulag. And so she spent seven years suffering for her faith. While she was there, the presence of Jesus showed up time and time again in tangible, physical, mystical, unexplainable ways. And the poetry just rolled out of her. She would memorize poetry during the interrogations and the beatings that she was writing in her head and then remembering it and saying it back to herself so that she came out with a plethora of things that she wrote. But she also discovered that people had been praying for her all over the world during those times. And here's what she wrote about that. She said, believe me, it was often thus, in solitary cells on winter nights, a sudden sense of joy and warmth and a resounding note of love, and then, on sleeping, I would know, a huddled by an icy wall. Someone is thinking of me now, petitioning the Lord for me. My dear ones, thank you all who did not falter, who believed in us in the most fearful prison hour, we probably would not have passed through everything from end to end, our heads held high, unbowed, without your valiant hearts to light our path. The experience of suffering for your faith has been chronicled throughout history as some of the greatest and sweetest and most profound times of personal growth that anybody's ever experienced. Let me leave you with the final one, and that is this, love your enemies. And the reason why I put enemies in quotes is because if you're a follower of Jesus, you don't have any enemies. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people, Paul says. There are Sinister forces out there, that's the devil working, but it's not against people. And what people need, even people that don't know the truth or that are promoting something that they may not even fully understand what's behind it. Like the teachers who taught me stuff that wasn't true about the world, 
Like, I can vilify those people or I can do what Jesus said to do, and that's love people. Think about the profound power of the one-two punch of truth and love demonstrated and lived out by people who care. That they love people, even people they disagree with, and those people can feel that love coming from God through you to them. What would happen if you started living that way in your life, unafraid of what people said, the consequences, trusting God, and full of love? What would happen if every Christian in the United States lived by truth, told the truth, and lived in love. I believe that God has put us at this place at this time to make a profound impact on the world in which we live and bring back the civility and the unity and the opportunity to minister to solve real problems in the world, to help people that are really hurting and to bring the truth of the gospel for the salvation of our country. But it's going to take real Christians committed to a real God who are committed to live truth and love from the depth of our hearts. May that be you. May that be me. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, I just thank you for the opportunity to live in this moment You put us here for a reason on this planet, in this place, at this time. May we not give in to comfort. May you well up within us the courage to pursue fully your plan. And Father, I pray that you'd use each person as a change agent for good through the power of your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.